Thank you. So I am indeed a neuroscientist. I spend most of my time studying the brain. And before I became a neuroscientist, I spent nearly a decade of my life as a computer hacker. I was living back in Israel, I had a cyber security company, and our job was to break into banks and government institutes and try to find flaws in the security to help them actually protect themselves better against hacker. And in the mix of those two professions, being a hacker and being a professor of neuroscience, I kind of found that there are some similarities and some things that I can borrow from one to another and use that to explain the most interesting thing uh, that I can find in our world, which is our brain. Now, the good news is the last decade has shown a surge of neuroscience research that actually allow us to understand our brains better and actually answer questions that were with us for decades. And one of the big questions that were answered is, in fact, what is the brain for? And one of the leading answers right now is that the brain, in many ways, is a machine that uh, nature gave us to make meaning of life, to take all of the memories, all of the experiences we have, and to form them and weave them into an experience. So what our brain actually does most of the time is take information that is in our memories and makes a story. And it's something that happens so fast that it happens under the hood without you having any control over that. If you see something, your brain's gonna make up a story. In fact, here's an example from uh, the 40s, where two psychologists were just showing people a little movie and they were asked them after the movie is over to tell uh, the scientists what they see in the movie. And even though the movie shows uh, two triangles and a circle and they're boxed in a little square, your brain cannot stop itself from telling you a story. You probably see a couple, the female is the circle, uh, her boyfriend is the square, there's a bully, a bigger one, they argue, maybe there's a love affair there. All of you see the same story there, even though the shapes are just shapes looking from above. This is something that our brain does all the time. It finds content and makes meaning. The thing is, many times we don't really control the story. The story emerges in such a way that even uh, our brain who makes it doesn't really know what influenced it, what actually made the story happen. So oftentimes, I'm still looking at the story. I'm gonna skip. <laughs> oftentimes, it ends in a really, really good positive ending. Uh, Oftentimes, there are things that leak into our narrative that affect and shape our story that we have no control over. For example, how we explain things if we get asked, tell me what the story is, sometimes doesn't align with what our brain actually made into the story. Here's an example that you see above me. In the US, there are a little bit over uh, the chance probability, uh, Americans whose name is Dennis, who chose to be dentists. Now, we all laugh because kind of, it sounds ridiculous. Why would my name my parents gave me on day one influence my choice of profession 30 years down the line? But the reality is that this is the case. There are a lot more dentists as dentists than the average. Uh, we think that the answer for that is something that uh, is known now as embodied cognition. So here is uh, me depicting this story. If your name is Dennis, you kind of go about your day, and at some point you hear someone calling your name. And you say, hey, what, what, what did you say? And the person says, oh no, I, I wasn't calling you, I just spoke about dentists. And you say, oh, never mind, I thought I, you're calling me. So over your life, you may have heard a lot more about dentists just because you thought it's you. So when you come to age 30 and you're about to choose a profession, you actually have different weights in your mind for dentists and you just think that they're much more popular than they are. <laughs> and it's not that uh, someone influenced you or pushed you, it's that it kind of happened. But here's the interesting thing. None of the dentists who became dentists will tell you if you ask them why I chose to be a dentist, that it's because their name is Dennis and that's what influenced them. <laughs> they're gonna come up with a story. They're gonna tell you that they always wanted to be doctors and they wanna help others and it's important for them and their parents told them something about Colgate or Crest and minting and uh, toothbrushes and so on. Flossing is really big there. And, and that's how the story is gonna come up. So our brain is gonna come up with a story even though the story might not be aligned with our reality. And in many ways we can do it to each and every one of you in simple experiments, show you how your brain, in one way, makes a decision, and in a different one, explains it, and those explanations aren't necessarily aligned with the decision itself. In a study I ran a few years ago, 
back in New York, we brought people to the lab and we had them uh, take a simple experiment where we asked them to make choices that are trivial. So in this example, we would show you two pictures of, say, guys with two cards, and we ask you to tell us who you find more attractive, the guy on the left or the guy on the right. You don't know any of them, they mean nothing to you, it's just a simple choice, you don't have to think hard, attraction is simple for us. So you see those two cards and I ask you, who do you find more attractive, and maybe you, who do you like more, left or right? <laughs> left. If you say left, we give you the card that you picked and we ask you to explain in one sentence why you picked this guy. I won't make you do it right now, <laughs> but normally we would uh, give you the card that you chose and we ask you to tell us why you picked this guy. And you might say, I really like his uh, smile. Uh, you say, fantastic, keep the card. Here are two new pictures with two different guys. Again, make a choice, take the card that you chose, explain why. You do it 100 times in the course of one hour, that's the experiment. There's only one thing here that's not told uh, to the subjects. There's a trick in this experiment that actually makes for the experiment's cool part, which is that the guy who gives you the card isn't just a regular guy, he's a magician that we hired, and he uses sleight of hands in every one of 20 trials or so to give you the card they didn't choose. So if you chose the card on the left, it gives you the card on the right. And here are the two interesting things that happen. The first thing is that people rarely notice that the card that they got isn't the one that they chose. <laughs> but what's more interesting is that they then go on to explain to us why this was their choice. You chose A, I give you B, you take B, and you say, I always wanted B because he has a really stern look that I really like. And here is the interesting moment. In time zero, your brain made a choice. It's still the choice in memory. In time five seconds, we ask you to explain the choice. You just load whatever is in your memory, and you come up with an answer. You always will come up with an answer. It's rare for our brain to just say, I have no idea. It just somehow happened to be the case. I have no idea why. We always like to have answers. And the importance of this is the first lesson that I want to share with you out of three. And that is that we can't really uh, trust our own mind in that case. My students created this T-shirt that they wear when they want to amplify the point that says, don't believe everything you think. <laughs> we spent a lot of time in the last couple of years talking about you know, fake news and information that's misguided, that goes into our brain, but the reality is that we spend a lot of time skeptics on everything that comes out, but once it's in our brain, we trust it. We never say, you know what, I have no idea why I think what I think. We just think that our brain is solid. Whatever is in there is true. And one of the arguments of neuroscience is that maybe that's not the case. Maybe we can actually hack into your brain plant ideas in there that you would think are yours, and you would go on to defend them, argue for them, believe them, and live life through a new narrative, one that weaves the memories into a story, just a story that you weren't the author of. So as a neuroscientist, uh, I wanted to do that, that, to try to get into people's minds, change something there, and see how they make up different stories and how it changes their conscious reality. So Neuroscience 101, if you wanted to actually uh, go into someone's brain, you have to know the language of the brain, and fortunately, the last uh, couple of decades have allowed neuroscientists to actually figure out the language of the brain. We don't know how uh, the brain speaks in all the codes, but we know what the code is, and simply put, if you were to zoom into a brain and look inside, what you'd see is a forest of little cells, we call them neurons, and they speak in a language that sounds like this. Those little bursts of activity that you heard, we call them spikes or firing, is one cell talking to another. They talk in a chemical language, but if we translate it into audio, it sounds like those firing of machine guns. And if we listen to one cell at a time, and we knew what happened in the outside world when this cell fired, we can actually correlate the activity of the cell with what it makes for. So if you see a, an image of your father and a cell fires, we might say this cell potentially codes something that has to do with your father. Maybe the image of your father, maybe a thought about your father, and so on. So the next thing uh, we wanted to know is, can we actually access the brain? Can we go inside and listen to those cells? Uh, there are a lot of uh, animal studies where scientists actually poke inside the animal brain, rats, mice, monkeys, and they listen to the cells directly. And most neuroscientists who study, neuroscientists study humans actually use imaging devices to look at the brains from the outside and infer what goes on inside. But uh, fortunately for me, I was able to be part of a small, uh, tiny group of neuroscientists that had access to a unique uh, situation that's in between. We work with patients undergoing brain surgery that allow us to, during the surgery, open their brains and put electrodes deep inside and eavesdrop on the activity of their cells while they're awake and talking with electrodes that listen to the cells in real time. So it looks something like this. 
Okay, I won't show you this because it's for too long, but the point is you have a surgery for a particular problem. The cell, I'm going to skip uh, this one. You have a surgery for a clinical purpose. You show up, we open your brain, and we put electrodes inside to figure out what's going on in your brain clinically. But to figure out what's going on, we have to keep you there for sometimes two weeks until the problem manifests itself. And then we just wait, and you just wait. And in the waiting period, you just have electrodes in your brain, and you kind of look at movies and uh, listen to stories, talk to your friends. So we can actually come to you and say, since we have electrodes in your brain, do you mind also having us show you movies and ask you which toothpaste you want to buy so we can understand how thinking works inside the brain? So this gives us access to the most remarkable golden data of neuroscience, human beings with open brains with electrodes inside their mind. What it allows us to do is do things like this, have a patient sit in bed and watch uh, things on a laptop while we poke in their brain and try to see what cells in their brain code for. Here's an example. So here is uh, one of uh, uh, our patients. What you see are images that she's seeing. And what you hear is the sound of one cell in her brain that fires when she sees something, trying to figure out what it cares for. <laughs> so this is one cell in this woman's head out of a couple of uh, dozens or millions even that code the concepts of Marilyn Monroe. Every time this woman thinks of Marilyn Monroe, those cells come to life. And it's really abstract a concept. It could be anything that reminds her of Marilyn Monroe, the, the word Marilyn Monroe, the smell that she associates with Marilyn Monroe, anything that would make her think of Marilyn Monroe would trigger the same cell. In fact, in your brains right now, if you knew who Marilyn Monroe was, same cells came to life and told you this is Marilyn Monroe. This is what thinking looks like inside the brain. So once we find cells like this, we can actually start increasing the gap between moments where your brain knows something and when you know the same thing and come in between and maybe hack and change some things. Here's what I mean by that. I can show you uh, pictures like this one. And what I can tell you already is that uh, for some of you, your brain already has a conflict, a little kind of problem inside. What the problem is, is that uh, it sees this picture and something bothers your brain. What uh, is uh, happening here is that there's actually two pictures here flickering between the two, and there's actually one element, one thing that changes between those two pictures, and your brain saw it right away. Your brain has cells that code things that are in the picture, and your brain has actually has cells that fire and stop, fire and stop, fire and stop. It's just that you don't see it right now. Somehow in your brain there's the answer, and it just doesn't tell you. If you hear me right now, you might not believe, so let's just do this. If you see this difference, raise your hand. Don't say what it is. OK, so now if you don't see it, you can believe me that some of your friends see that. You get much more nervous. You start uh, looking at the picture from top to bottom. You look at the sky from left to right. You count windows on the airplane. You count the shadows of the soldiers. You count shoulders. Uh, it's the engine right at the center. <laughs> if you don't see it still, raise your hand. Uh, uh, OK. So the point is that uh, it's right in the center. Your eyes saw it all the time. There are cells in your brain that codes engines, and they fired and stopped and fired and stopped. And somehow we didn't see it. And the good news is that you can never not see it again. Once you see it spent for the rest of your life, it's going to be there. There are many other examples. But here is the moment here. There's a, there's a unique case where there's a cell in your brain that knows something, but you don't know it. And we can now come in between and actually see if we can change the story by telling you different things. So what we do in one of the experiments with my uh, patients we have them play a little game. We tell them, here is a little box. It has two buttons, one button on the left, one button on the right. And we ask you to just sit here for half an hour and just press buttons randomly. Whenever you feel like, press left or right. No cue to when to start. It doesn't matter which one. Just make decisions. What we care about is seeing how your brain looks when you make decisions. So patient might sit there for a while and then suddenly press the button on the left. And when she does, a light turns on. Tell the patient, this light that you see here indicates to you that we're right now saving data from your brain. So this is how we actually uh, can analyze things later. So we ask you for one important thing. Every time you see the lights on after you press a button, please wait for a few seconds for the lights to turn off, and then you can start again. Just don't touch anything when the lights are on. It ruins the experiment. The patient says, no problem, and they go on for a while. And here's the cool thing. We have the computer for a while, listen to their brain while they make decisions. But after some trials, we actually figure out how their brain looks a few seconds before they press the buttons. As in, we know that you're about to press a button in, say, three seconds. So if we know here that you're about to press the button here, what we do then is we switch something in the computer, and we start to go into a interception mode, where we turn the lights on a little bit before you press the buttons. 
So every time you're about to reach the buttons, the lights turn on before, and then when you press the buttons, there's a big buzzer in the room, and we tell you, what did you do? You're doing the experiment. We ask you one thing, please don't touch the buttons with the lights on. I'm so sorry, doctor, it's gonna hurt by itself. Never mind, you ruined everything, but we're gonna start again. Just make sure you don't do it again. <laughs> and what you see time and again is the patients are realizing quickly that they can't do it, right? They try to kind of go faster, or they try to kind of trick us to go to the right and then move to the left, but they can't because we're inside their mind when they know they're already three seconds behind me. Here's kind of how it looks. So in a way, we're talking to this woman's <laughs> head behind her back. And what it allows us to do for the first time is just show our patients this ability to actually do things to your brain without you being involved. Now, it of course creates all kinds of philosophical questions. What is you? What is your brain? Who am I talking to? But the point is that for the first time, we're able to kind of change small things and have you experience a reality that suggests that you're actually a little bit behind the present time. Now, where it becomes creepy and a little bit uh, alarming is that for the first time, about three years ago, my colleagues uh, realized that there are moments in life that we can hack into everyone's brain. Moments where you don't have to have electrodes inside to actually figure out what's going on. There are moments where your guards are down, you're very easily hackable, and you're not there to actually change things. And one of those key moments is when you sleep. So it turns out that sleep isn't a uniform thing. It's not that we turn off for seven hours and come back to life afterwards. Sleep is made of all kinds of stages and, and uh, phases, and there's a few of them. One that happens every 90 minutes that actually is a deep sleep state, but your brain is awake as in it's listening. And using some cues from the outside world, they can actually influence your behavior. Uh, cues primarily are olfactory. And they allow us to, for instance, take smokers who come to the lab, have them take a nap for about three hours, and in the right moment, spray the smell of uh, nicotine into their nose, making their brain essentially think about smoking and reassess the importance of that. And immediately after, we blast their brain with the smell of uh, rotten eggs and create this pairing that makes them think that maybe smoking is not ideal. When they wake up, they have no idea what happened, but suddenly they don't want to smoke anymore for a few days after. They have a decay. Now, it doesn't really change your behavior entirely. You still go back to your behavior. Uh, there are things that uh, are harder to change, but the point is that we find now moments that we can do things to your brain that actually changes who you are. And the key thing is that when you wake up, you would never say, you know, I have no idea why I don't want to smoke anymore. You would come up with a story. And the more we probe the story, the more we ask you to explain to us things, you will actually create a web of suggestion around the story that makes it even harder to change. So the way to change behavior isn't to make you, you know, go to a therapy or uh, think about what you did and, and kind of go uh, hard into explaining why you did something, but actually just creating a little small change that you wouldn't be aware of and have you explain what it is Later on, you will create more and more reasons for that for your own mind. So neuroscientists are now looking at various ways to use this window in your sleep where your brain actually listens to change some things. We're trying to see if we can indeed stop smoking entirely, uh, whether we can actually take traumatic experiences and make you kind of think about them differently during your night, so you wake up differently. In the commercial aspect, I also have a little uh, position as a business school professor. We try to see if we can actually commercialize this canvas that we call dreams. Up to now, dreams are kind of something that happens to us. We don't really know what makes them uh, the way they are, uh, but we still think about them uh, highly in the real world. So if you woke up in the morning and you told your spouse that you dreamt about your ex-girlfriend, she would be upset with you in the real world, even though you might say, you know, it was my brain who made the story. I didn't even uh, decide to have that, but somehow we think that they mean something. Now we can start to actually navigate your dreams access the content and actually see something about what's going on in your dreams and actually give you access to this uh, magical uh, experience that happens when you close your eyes to the point that we can, to an extent, nudge you into dreaming about specific topics. So you can imagine in five years uh, going to sleep and ordering a particular dream or going to a date and when you go to sleep actually continuing the date or ordering the dream by Spielberg, or something like this. The hallmark of what uh, our lab is trying to do right now when it comes to change behavior is not successful. But that's what everyone is interested in, so I'll just mention that we are not able to do that, but uh, that's kind of what we're after. That is to teach you something when you sleep, so you can go to sleep and wake up knowing Kung Fu. Doesn't work uh, so far, but maybe that's the thing that we all want to change, like going to your brain and actually do something that will make you wake up with different experiences. The last thing I want to mention 
is that it doesn't just end with uh, uh, things like this. We can actually entirely change uh, the frame of thinking that you have in your mind. More and more, we realize that our brain is limited by the set of possibilities that we have. A colleague of mine uh, here from uh, England uh, actually doesn't have his uh, left hand. And he, being an engineer, also engineered a little prosthetic hand for himself that he can control. And he uses a little uh, mind machine uh, interface that allows him to essentially make his hand move, open his fingers, and so on, do, do a few uh, remarkable things just with his mind controlling a prosthetic arm. The coolest thing about uh, this uh, prosthetic arm is that he can do things that you cannot do. And because he can do things like, uh, for instance, rotate his arm entirely the other side, he can also uh, think thoughts you cannot think. Like he can think a thought, uh, like uh, let's screw a light bulb in one move. But you don't have this thought in your mind. It's not part of your reality. You have to think all the thoughts that control uh, switching again and again. He can just think a thought that you cannot think. So the reality is that the more we play with our brain, we actually create a repertoire of new thoughts that people didn't have when they were born that we can actually increase in their mind. So the last lesson I want to leave you with that uh, to me is the most important one. What neuroscience has shown us in the last, I would say, 10 years, is that uh, under the hood of our brain lies a variety, li li variety of thoughts that we didn't know exist, and they drive a lot of our story. What we do mostly is come up with an answer afterwards to why we did what we did, not essentially knowing entirely what drove this thing. Now, this uh, seems pretty alarming to a lot of people. They think, what does it mean that I don't know what's going on in my brain? And I have an analogy that I like to end with that to me uh, makes it not a scary thing, but actually a fascinating, unique, uh, remarkable thing. 402 years ago, in 1616, Galileo Galilei pointed his telescope to the moons of Jupiter, and he observed their orbits. And what he saw was that they were circling the uh, planet in a way that uh, wasn't aligned with his predictable equations. And the only way for him to explain that was to uh, realign the making of the solar system, to change how we think about the world, to put the sun in the center and planet Earth as the third planet from the center. Now, this, to him, felt like a dethronement of humankind. What does it mean that we're just one more planet out of many and not the center of the universe? But once he accepted the reality, he opened up a path of 400 years for us to explore the wide reaches of the universe, to see far a bigger world than the one people had 400 years ago. In the same way, our understanding of the brain in the last couple of years makes us understand that in our own mind, we might not be the most important thing. We might not be the sun of our brain, but just Earth. And there may be other voices in our head that govern how we think that we right now have no access to, but gradually, using neuroscience, we give them rise. and We understand more and more about uh, what's going on in our mind. To the point that we can actually explain why dentists uh, choose a profession, or why people make choices, and how to actually change people's choices so they will have access to a full repertoire of options. So you know why you vote the way you vote, or why you love the way you love, or why you choose the way you choose. And this won't just give us access to our mind. It will actually allow us to do what Galileo did to the universe, which is understand the most uh, remarkable thing about the universe, which is us. Thank you.